we'll resume the care board's hearing of August 12th. And next we have Gary's presentation of its budget. Um, our last presenter, Ms. Sweetnam, was her first care board hearing. And if my memory serves, I believe it's Mr. Bennett's last. Um, well, yes. Mr. Bennett, thanks for your service. To the, <laughs> thanks for your service to the state. And um, I welcome you to your last care board budget hearing. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Chair Foster. Chair Foster, just to note that we need uh, oath to be administered to witnesses. All right. Um, would you mind doing that? Yeah, happy to. Um, just see, Mr. Bennett, uh, who all is going to be uh, providing testimony today? We have uh, mm -hmm. our interim financial chief financial officer, Bill King, our controller, Steve Conti, our chief medical officer, Dr. Josh White, our vice president of nursing, Jill Markowski, and our vice president of operations, Rebecca O'Berry. Okay. Uh, so let's do it this way. I'm going to uh, read the oath and I'll ask that after I read it, each person who plans on providing uh, testimony, simply uh, state your name for the record and say that uh, uh, I, I do uh, or, or that you uh, agree. Um, so we'll, we'll do it that way. That way we have everybody's names on the record. Uh, so uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Dan Bennett, I do. Bill uh, King. Bill King, I do. Josh White, I do. Jill Markowski, I do. Rebecca O'Berry, I do. Stephen Conti, I do. That was everyone. Thanks very much. You're all sworn in, and it sounds like I can just turn it to, to you, Mr. Bennett. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Steve is going to uh, share our slides. So Steve, if you would please bring them up. Okay, you can go to the first slide, Steve. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity today to discuss Gifford Medical Center and our fiscal year 2025 budget. Um, I just noted the colleagues of mine who are going to be joining uh, me today, and uh, we look forward to having this conversation with the Green Mountain Care Board. I want to start uh, first today by, uh, by noting Gifford's unique and innovative governance structure, uh, as you'll see on the screen. Uh, Gifford is one of only a few organizations in the country um, and there's either one or two other organizations that have the same structure we do, uh, where a, qual a federally qualified health center or FQHC is the parent organization for a hospital. In our case, there's a second subsidiary corporation as well, Gifford Retirement Community. FQHCs are regulated on the federal level by HRSA, and like with hospitals, uh, that regulatory environment can be complicated. Uh, one of the key regulatory principles for FQHCs is that they cannot be owned or controlled by another organization, such as a hospital, and therefore our structure reflects that requirement with the FQHC being the parent organization. Uh, of note, that also uh, is consistent with the way that Gifford has operated uh, as a primary care-driven organization. Gifford Medical Center, uh, although a subsidiary of the FQHC, is the largest component of our organization in terms of revenue, expenses, and the number of employees. And the budget and other financial information we're presenting uh, today to the board is solely for the hospital, Gifford Medical Center. That being said, there are um, times in the, in the presentation today where we will talk about primary care uh, and, uh, and affiliated uh, services, uh, and we will uh, do our best to know where we're talking about the FQHC. Next slide, please, Steve. So just to further illustrate, I, I want to note um, services that are within the hospital and uh, services within the FQHC. And first on the hospital side, um, we are, as you know, a 25 bed critical access hospital and uh, contained within those uh, 25 beds are our medical surgical unit, uh, our swing beds, and our birthing center. Our surgical and specialty care practices are located within the hospital structure, and you'll see examples uh, on the slide of those services that we provide at Gifford. I have noted on the slide uh, with an asterisk uh, two services in which we collaborate with other hospitals, 
Uh, we collaborate with Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Orthopedics for joint replacement uh, to supplement our in-house uh, general orthopedics. And we also collaborate with the, with the UVM Health Network on oncology services. Uh, and these collaborations allow us to offer these services safely to our patients in their local community. In addition, all of our ancillary service, our emergency department, our surgical services, uh, and our rehab services uh, fall within the hospital structure. Uh, next slide. Our FQHC, uh, we operate, we operate uh, throughout uh, central Vermont from five sites, uh, and this encompasses all of our primary care services, family and internal medicine, pediatrics, our psychiatry and counseling, uh, and uh, all of our other services uh, that we provide here. The FUHC model uh, does allow uh, for better integration of all these services uh, within a primary care structure and within our structure as well, we're able to integrate better within the hospital uh, side of things also. So it's a good, uh, it is a good structure for us to uh, be able to share those services. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, current state uh, with Gifford, uh, this 2024 has been a recovery year for Gifford. Uh, we had uh, um, a good many things going on. Uh, our team uh, has been engaged in implementing a new electronic health record, uh, and also along with that, improvements to our revenue cycle operations. Uh, we've continued to identify uh, cost savings uh, throughout our organization, uh, and we uh, also continue to engage in numerous workforce development programs. All of these efforts are in support of our work to improve affordability, to meet our community need, and to create a sustainable plan for Gifford's future. Next slide. There are a number of risks inherent uh, in, uh, in our current environment. Uh, and the Gifford team is working diligently on many of uh, the topics that I'm going to cover in the next two slides. Uh, some of the challenges and the opportunities uh, that we face are uh, within our control, while others are not. Uh, we initially had planned for our electronic health record implementation to go live in July 2023, so that would have uh, fallen in the previous fiscal year. But we ultimately made the decision to move that into October 2023 to uh, ensure a better um, a better experience with our go live. So uh, that moved it into the current fiscal year 2024. We are progressing well uh, with this implementation, but as uh, is expected, we will continue to make improvements um, going on uh, with the system, both in terms of stabilizing the system and optimizing the system. Uh, we've enacted a financial improvement plan uh, that is achieving results, but we need to ensure that we can uh, recognize a bottom line that's adequate for us to make necessary investments uh, in order for us to keep our population health programs that impact affordability and also to make reinvestments in Gifford's plant and equipment. Uh, there are statewide challenges that are beyond our control and they continue to hamper our efforts. Uh, I don't think it'd be news to anybody that uh, Vermont does not have enough working age people to fill our jobs, whether that's in healthcare or otherwise. Uh, we also lack housing, uh, and these create a barrier for us to be able to retain and recruit a qualified workforce. So in addition to our efforts here at Gifford, there needs to be, uh, these issues need to be addressed uh, on a statewide basis, or they'll continue to, act to impact access, affordability, and the sustainability of our healthcare system. Next slide. There are many positive things going on uh, at Gifford. We've made critical investments in population health, and these investments directly impact our ability to provide the right services in the right setting, and this positively impacts affordability. We're leveraging our new systems and the data they provide us to inform decision-making throughout our organization, something that uh, is uh, long overdue. And Gifford continues to cultivate strong relationships with our local, regional, and statewide partners to meet the needs that exist here in our community. Next slide. 
Gifford is governed by a volunteer board, and one of their uh, one of their ongoing duties is to create a strategic plan uh, that they do every three years uh, to guide the work that we do here at Gifford. Uh, our current strategic plan expires at the end of this calendar year, and that plan has emphasized our people, population health, investments in our infrastructure, and also our governance. Our board will conduct a new strategic planning process in 2025, calendar year 2025, in which they will incorporate data from many sources. And these will include our 2024 community health needs assessment, our employee engagement survey, which uh, is going on now, our community listening tours, uh, Act 167, and many other sources. Next slide. As a community-based and community-governed entity, our Gifford team seeks input from those we serve. Over the past two years, we have conducted listening tours in several of our communities. Themes that we heard in our first year, which was in 2022, included access to mental health services, transportation, food, and housing as, as issues. Based on those conversations, we invited three of our local partner organizations who focus on these areas to join us last fall in 2023 to speak about their services and resources and also to hear additional feedback uh, from the communities. And the themes that we heard last fall were consistent with what um, with, with those that were in our 2024 community health needs assessment. Again, access to transportation, housing, medical, mental health and dental care. As I noted on the previous slide, we will utilize this information in our strategic planning process going forward. Next slide. I noted earlier that uh, we have a financial improvement plan and uh, we have in, uh, implemented uh, many cost containment efforts uh, here at Gifford. Some of those are highlighted on, uh, on this slide and they include adjusting some of our staffing models uh, in order to align with patient utilization. Uh, we've been able to do this in our medical surgical area and with our hospitalist and also with our respiratory therapy department. Um, we've been able to combine some management positions uh, and this has been something we've been able to use our position control process to help with, uh, where we're able to evaluate uh, positions when they come open and uh, have discussions with people in those areas to determine whether there's a more efficient way for us to to meet the obligations of those positions. Uh, and we've been able to do that this year. We also took a big step this year in that we outsourced portions of our revenue cycle functions, uh, our billing and our coding. And from that, we've been able to drive improvements both in terms of uh, our collections from commercial and government insurance programs, while also having some cost savings. And Gifford has long worked uh, with our partners at Efficiency Vermont to be a leader in seeking energy efficiency. Uh, and this is something that we'll continue to do over time. We've seen benefits uh, in, in this work, both in terms of uh, having funding available to help us as we engage in projects, but also in uh, recognizing uh, operational costs on an annual basis. And we have saved a significant amount of money since um, uh, through those efforts since 2017. Um, so these are things we've been working on this year, and uh, these are uh, items that Gifford will continue to, to work on going forward. We'll continually seek out areas where we can drive uh, efficiencies and cost savings. I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Jill Markowski uh, to talk about some of our workforce initiatives. Jill? Hey, uh, good afternoon. As Dan said, I'm Dr. Jill Markowski. I'm the VP of Nursing here at Gifford been proud to be with this team for the past two and a half years, and my primary focus really has been trying to help stabilize the nursing workforce. To kind of back up a little bit, um, pre-COVID, Gifford had the comfort of really having a locally sourced, long-tenured nursing workforce. Some could say that we had lifers. They came to work at Gifford and have stayed here. But post-COVID, we've seen we've had many retirements, some nurses kind of aging out of the workforce, and unfortunately, there's no workforce or pool or bench to readily replace those folks. And the same issues that Dan talked about a little bit earlier um, in the state of Vermont kind of affect the Randolph area as well. So that shrinking workforce of that young demographic, limited housing options, 
and not as many opportunities for our young nurses, meaning they kind of don't stay here in Vermont. So like many places, we had to resort to using travelers. And as we know, that transient workforce that's kind of paid four times what our normal staff are and are not really committed to the organization or the community is not who we want caring for our patients. So we really had to play a bit of catch up at Gifford to kind of meet our peer offerings for uh, recruitment and retention and figure out really innovative ways and creative ways, giving our limited resources to uh, recruit new folks. We had to highlight that all the positives that we had here at Gifford is a great place to work and a great place to receive care. Some of the things that we have done, we've really increased our wages substantially to remain market competitive. Of course, that's an ever moving target. Um, we've increased our benefits. We've increased our tuition reimbursement and in the amount and the coverage. We're working on creating our clinical advancement program. We reset all staff schedules and staffing patterns to be aligned with patient needs, not just to Dan's point earlier about having some efficiency and cost savings, but also making sure that the schedules were fair, equitable, and provided nurses really desirable stretches of times off and repeatable patterns. So all weekends off are at least three days. Uh, we have proud to say that our nurse patient ratios really support best practice and quality care. We make sure that we align our patient needs with nurse competency. Um, and we spent a ton of time focusing on our onboarding. We wanted to create that environment that's supportive and results in successful onboarding that helps transitions those new nurses, some of them having been um, educated during COVID times into practice. We revised and um, streamlined our general nursing orientation. We adopted a methodology um, for our new hires and our residency program that is competency-based. Um, we focused on those preceptors, those folks that were going to be teaching our new hires, um, gave them education, skills, preceptor training, additional differentials if they're having a student with them or a new hire, and created weekly meetings with the new hire, the educator, the preceptor, and the leader. It was really successful in that we could really easily identify any issues, and we were agile enough to adjust quickly. Proud to say we also have partnered with Dartmouth-Hitchcock and have a way in which we do our AORN Periop 101 program where they're able to go over to Dartmouth and have that clinical experience. So they're able to see um, a large number of the same cases in a way where they can start to understand patterns and consistency and start to look at those uh, efficiencies at well, um, as well. We also then started to recognize the folks that we had from a retention standpoint. We rolled out um, formal recognition programs here, the DAISY program for nursing. I'm proud to say we've had over 120 nominations, four great celebrations, and we have another one coming up next week. Um, but despite all that, we still needed to kind of grow our own. Um, we were really excited to be part of the Vermont Business Roundtable and the Vermont Pi um, Talent Pipeline Phase Two project. Unfortunately, that funding was lost. Um, so we had to pivot and reset, and we have done that. We've developed our own program um, because we don't have that external workforce pool. And we did have a lot of folks who really dreamed of becoming a nurse, but couldn't financially afford to do so. So we partnered with uh, VSAC, CCV, VTSU, and I'm really proud to say that this fall we have our six, our first cohort of six folks going in with their prereqs, three others in the actual nursing years, and then we're um, also investing in six nurse leaders to get their MSN because there's also a nursing um, faculty shortage here in our schools of nursing. And there's not enough faculty to prepare um, our students. Um, but this really goes to beyond just giving them the finance. We've also been giving them the emotional support, encouragement, and coaching and investing in them so that they're successful. This fall, we are expanding this to try to partner with our local high schools and increase the awareness of opportunities at Gifford Healthcare, um, job shadows, internships, and then also working to create some formal educational support pathways for students that maybe thought that they couldn't possibly go into uh, radiology or nursing. Um, we also have had a successful MA program. We hold that program twice a year. Those MA students usually come from within and then join our workforce. Uh, LNA program, we've also partnered with some outside agencies and we're actually investigating doing our own. One of the biggest investments that we've done is we hired, um, created a joint affiliation position. This is a shared position 
that Gifford Medical Center has. Um, there's some other hospitals in Vermont that also use this model, but we pay the salary for a Gifford MSN prepared nurse educator. And then she works as VTSU clinical faculty and manages those rotations for the Randolph cohort. So it's going to Mene, going to Woodbridge, going to the Sim Lab, going to any of our sites here at Gifford Healthcare. Um, VTSU does reimburse us the faculty pay portion, but that does not come close to covering the salary as we pay the salary and the benefits for this educator to really work as VTSU clinical faculty full time. Now, some might say this view is an additional salary expense, but we see really beyond that. We view this as an investment in our future nurses at Gifford and in the state of Vermont and to help stabilize those VTSU nursing programs. With all that said and all that focus here locally, we still didn't have enough folks and needed to look beyond our regular uh, local workforce. I'm proud to say that I was the first to partner with a company called InSpring, where there's foreign trained nurses that you work to help them convert their student visa into a work visa. And we hired um, an amazing nurse, Ana Gonzalez. Um, she's originally from Columbia, was trained down in Texas and Louisiana. She joined us this March. She went to Dartmouth for the uh, Periop 101 program and she's successfully working in our OR. She's been um, a great addition. And we have two other nurses that will be joining us this fall, one from Nigeria and one from India. So with all that said, here's some of our results. Uh, that joint affiliation nurse educator position resulted in our nurse Nina supporting the entire clinical rotations for over 105 students last, acad last academic year. We've onboarded new nurses into an environment where they can really safely transition into practice. And we have an 87% graduate nurse retention rate. I'm gonna say that one more time because that one makes me happy. 87% graduate nurse retention rate. We also have converted some travelers into our permanent staff. They kind of have come here as travelers. They like the culture, they like the environment and they signed on. So we've been um, happy to say we've reduced our traveler usage by 67%. Still struggling in a couple of specialty areas like the OR, um, but I am confident that by February of 2025, I should not have any uh, OR nurse travelers. And while we still have challenges as a critical access hospital, um, you know, we continue to have our culture and our commitment to our mission remain our guiding framework. Um, I'm pleased to say we're able to evolve and adapt and we're always kind of recognizing and valuing our best asset, which is our staff. Um, it's been it's been really a great uh, a time for us to kind of rethink how we do things and to do things in a little bit different way. And we've been very successful that with that. Uh, so yeah, thank you for letting me share some of the successes we've accomplished. I'll gladly answer questions at the presentation end. And I think Dr. Josh White, our CMO and a strong member of our ED provider team is up next. Thank you, Jill. Uh, my name is Josh White. I am an emergency physician and have served as chief medical officer here at Gifford for a number of years. Um, and uh, it's my opportunity to introduce a project we call the Value Committee. Uh, here at Gifford, we have long believed in the uh, um, transition away from fever service care into outcome-based care and quality-based uh, care, um, ultimately to achieve the goals that our patients have um, rather than the, the drivers of finance. Uh, subsequent to that, about a year and a half ago, we established what is called the Value Committee with an attempt to marry uh, the cost of care with the outcomes that uh, uh, we want for our patients. Um, I'm gonna talk about two projects uh, that we've embarked upon and continue with. First one uh, regards high-end radiological testing, specifically uh, CT scans and MRIs. Uh, we looked at uh, CT scan utilization and MRI utilization in primary care and CT, sc CT scan utilization in the emergency department. This is a focus of a number of quality groups with the recognition that there are a significant volume of tests being performed that uh, patients don't really need and that don't improve the outcomes of care. Obviously, these things aren't free, uh, and uh, the community and the patients foot these bills. We asked ourselves what we could do, um, and uh, so we started with a data collection period 
uh, during uh, fiscal year uh, 2022. Uh, and then uh, um, in 2023, embarked upon an educational process for the staff. Um, there was no carrot, no stick. It was our presumption that uh, upon being shown the data, um, providers would largely fix this themselves in recognition that these are uh, highly intelligent, highly driven people, and they don't want to be uh, outliers. Um, uh, after six months of educational intervention, uh, we did CMEs, uh, we did uh, um, talks at uh, the uh, um, division meetings, um, uh, we brought in presenters and sent out uh, um, information. Uh, ultimately, uh, in primary care, uh, we generated a 15.3% reduction in utilization of CTs and 11% reduction in uh, MRIs. In the emergency department, we saw a 6.4% reduction. Um, what that bears out to annualized is uh, we're predicting that we eliminated in primary care about 163 CTs um, uh, that didn't get performed that otherwise would have an 82 MRIs. And 156 CTs in the uh, 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 emergency department. Um, uh, the savings here um, uh, comes out uh, to uh, around four hundred thousand uh, dollars estimated. Obviously, we're trying to predict the future, so I I can't say that specifically. Um, but aside from that, uh, this includes a, a reduction in utilization, freeing up space for other patients. Uh, it frees up patient time that otherwise would have been spent, um, contrast dye injury and uh, injury from the radiation that the patients would have received. This is a project that we're going to have to periodically repeat. Um, uh, old practice habits die hard uh, and we have new hires, um, so it's our intent to continue this uh, periodically. Second project I'd like to talk about was a, a high emergency department utilizer project. Um, this is in recognition that if a patient is repeatedly visiting the emergency department, um, somewhere in there, there is a failure in care. Um, uh, if you have to come to the ER again and again, you're not getting what you need. Um, uh, in looking at the uh, research on this, um, uh, Essentially, each individual patient has a reason uh, where they don't mesh with the medical system as designed. Something about them, uh, it just doesn't work and they're not getting what they need. In response to that, we developed a multidisciplinary committee um, for each and every patient uh, on our list. Um, and we brought in um, every healthcare personnel that touched the patient, uh, be they Gifford employees or not. Um, we include the designated agencies, um, the uh, uh, local EMS agencies, everybody that would know something about that patient. In those multidisciplinary groups, um, we shared information, um, uh, who knew what about this person, um, who had some insight as to why care was failing. And then we had conversations about how could we redesign our approach to this person uh, to better meet their needs. Um, we did our data analysis for this one. Uh, beginning in January of 23, each patient was individualized, so it started at different times for different people. Um, and then uh, um, our intervention uh, were the plans that came out of those uh, individualized meetings. Ultimately, we selected 18 patients uh, and observed a 33% reduction in ED utilization uh, amongst those patients. <clears throat> This was extrapolated of those 18 patients uh, to uh, um, a little under 87 visits per year predicted saved. And had a cost savings of uh, about $131,000, um, uh, over $7,000 per patient. Um, this is something that we also uh, intend to continue. Um, it, we feel it's a significant benefit to patients. Um, no one wants to be in the ER uh, as a general rule if you don't have to be. Um, everyone would prefer to have their needs addressed and, and not go round and round in this cycle. Um, so thus far, um, we're estimating an annualized savings coming out of the value committee of around $542,000. And I'd like to point out that that is not savings uh, that Gifford is observing. Uh, this is $542,000 that is not being billed to patients. Um, although financially, that's that's a difficult thing for us to swallow. Um, ultimately, uh, we believe that's the way healthcare is going. Um, and uh, it's our attempt to start to straddle that line. 
Uh, so I'll wrap up my part of the presentation. Uh, and as Jill said, we'll answer questions at the end. Uh, and I will pass the mic to Rebecca O'Berry. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca O'Berry. I'm the Vice President of Operations here at Gifford. Um, I'm here to talk about health equity. Um, and uh, we are committed to continuing our work in health equity and uh, reducing disparities across the continuum of care and uh, through our communities. We are identifying and addressing these disparities through work that our um, DEI committee is, is doing. Um, this team is focused on ensuring that Gifford continues to be a welcoming environment for our staff and for our patients and visitors. This team started with educating our workforce and promoting awareness around DEI. We recently completed our community health needs assessment, as we've already talked about, and the information gleaned from that, um, from that survey is going to help drive the work that our population health team and our DEI teams are doing. This will help us create a framework from which to do our work. Um, we are focusing efforts on optimizing our new EMR, which we also talked about a little bit earlier. Um, this EMR has a way of funneling information from our patients uh, on their social determinants of health into registries. And those registries can then be analyzed and pulled by our population health team. And then the work for outreach to our patients is performed by our community health team. Um, these uh, elements of SUH are helping us identify barriers and um, other ways that we need to improve across our communities with our part community partners in reducing those disparities and getting people in um, and accessing care that they need. Our upcoming strategic planning process will also include specific efforts for populations experiencing health disparities or who are at greater, at greater risk. We're gonna utilize both the community health needs assessment data and the data from our registries to help formulate that strategic planning process. Currently, we're in the process of partnering with an outside organization to host Lunch and Learn uh, virtual platforms to further educate and openly discuss disparities and how to help for our entire Gifford community. Some of the ongoing initiatives we have are promoting gender, gender affirming care in our provider biographies online, the creation and maintenance of a Gifford DEI webpage highlighting activities and awareness and encouraging the use of appropriate pronouns and names within our organization. I am uh, going to take questions as uh, others have said at the end of the presentation and we'll turn over the mic to Bill. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Bill King. I'm the interim chief financial officer here at Gifford Medical Center. Um, and I'm here to talk about the, some components of our budget request this year. Um, first off, we're requesting a 6.8% commercial rate increase, which equates to $2,272,000. Um, and our plans to uh, use that money is to cover our inflation, which uh, we have on a weighted average basis, 2.8%, uh, um, and also to partially cover some of the uh, capital spending that we would uh, would like to have accomplished. Next slide, Steve. Uh, next element of our budget is that our net patient service revenue budget to budget year over year um, is going to re increase by 8.2%. Um, elements of that uh, increase are, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the rate request, um, at Gifford Medical Center, we are uh, going to budget a reduction in our fixed perspective payment um, due to expiration of Medicaid COVID era expansion. Um, we are also budgeting on a budget to budget basis, um, a decrease in utilization. But as you've heard throughout the presentation, we'll be leveraging our new EMR and our partner um, outsourcing partners with our budget billing and coding um, to see extra um, income there. Um, one thing that is a is a decrease to net patient service revenue is uh, our budget for fees and discount. But just as in other areas of uh, Gifford's community, we feel it's the right, right thing to do leaning into um, providing free and discounted care um, to our patients. 
Next slide. Um, after it was all said and done with all the discounts um, from all the work that all the team has been doing to re maintain expenses at their at their lowest level, um, our margin uh, budget is 4.41%. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, Gifford Medical Center, uh, along with its other affiliated organizations, is a member of a obligated borrowing group. Um, so Gifford Medical Center is uh, jointly and severably liable to meet all debt covenants of, of the corporation. Uh, a recurring theme is that uh, Gifford Medical Center has budgeted for capital expenditures in FY25. Um, we're budgeting $3.4 million for um, much needed capital uh, improvements. Next slide. Um, other elements of our budget is uh, our other operating revenue is budgeted to decrease um, from 24 to 25, partially because we are regrouping some school based therapies uh, up into net patient service revenue and not uh, into other operating. Uh, we're also budgeting zero dollars um, for 340B due to pharmacy company restrictions. Um, on a non-operating basis, um, we are we are budgeting for contributions um, from our community because Gifford is fortunate to have the support of its com of its community um, year over year. Um, but one thing that we are not budgeting for is uh, any investment gains or losses, as the stock market um, is unpredictable at best. And I too will be answering questions as we move through. Um, next slide, Steve. Um, as mentioned, $3.4 million of annual depreciation. Uh, our average age of plant uh, currently is uh, greater than 18 years. And the $3.4 million that we would like to spend uh, on capital improvements is less than our uh, annual depreciation. So our age of plant will increase um, even though um, we're able to spend this this money, things that we've deferred from 2022 and be is uh, uh, emergency room uh, renovation. We need to do some roof replacements, um, some remodeling, and larger equipment purchases uh, would be our anesthesia machines, uh, a C arm, an X ray machine, and an echocardiograph machine. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dan. Thank you, Bill. Um, I want to uh, just start before I go through the last um, the last slide here to uh, thank the Green Mountain Care Board for uh, your understanding last year. You did uh, make a request to come out and meet uh, here at Gifford uh, first uh, in the in the middle of uh, 2023, and we asked you to. Uh, please reconsider coming in the fall due to our the work we were doing in our electronic health record. Uh, and then we moved our implementation to the fall. And uh, once again, you worked with us uh, and um, uh, showed patience with us on that. So uh, thank you for doing that. Um, if uh, you would like to um, reissue that invitation, we'd be glad to uh, welcome you here uh, down in Randolph and uh, show you uh, some of the things we're working on, uh, including some of the things that you've heard today, uh, but we'd be happy uh, to host you uh, for that. And we appreciate, again, your your patience last year. So uh, in, clo in, in closing, um, uh, our Gifford team uh, is focused uh, on the right things. Uh, we're currently working to meet the needs of our community uh, by investing in, act in, in activities that will keep people healthy uh, and avoid more costly services where possible. We are engaged in making our services sustainable and working with multi, uh, multiple partners in these endeavors. Uh, we're working to ensure that we have a talented, engaged, and engaged workforce, despite forces uh, beyond our control. And we believe that all who need our services should be able to access them. So uh, once again, our 2025 uh, budget supports these efforts, and I thank you for your consideration, and I'll turn it back to Chair Foster. 
Thank you all very much. Um, I'll open up to the other board members for any questions they may have. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mr. Bennett and your team and welcome Mr. King. Um, this I guess is our last uh, time together, Mr. Bennett. So I, I wish you well on your next chapter. Uh, my next chapter is coming soon, <laughs> a couple more years, but. Um, so a couple of questions, uh, actually a lot of questions, but I'll try to keep them concise. I wanna understand the 8.2% NPR uh, increase. And I'm wondering if, and this may be something that you can either walk through us through now or, or submit separately, but I'm trying to understand the, the price effect separated from the utilization effect, separated from the revenue cycle EHR effect in particular. Um, and I understand utilization is declining. The price is obviously to some, you know, we know what the rate request is. Um, I am trying to isolate the EHR revenue cycle effect in that 8.2%. Is that something you can speak to now, or is that something that we should just wait for further, you know? Bill, submission? is that something you, oh, sorry. Bill, ahead, is that yeah. something you can speak to now, or do you want to follow up? Hey, I can speak to one high level item um, in, in the budget is with the, our, new, our new EMR and our outsourced partners, we've drastically reduced the amount of denials that, that the organization has seen. So from one year to the next, we're, um, we're, it's work that we were already doing, bills that we were already sending out. Um, to the payers, um, but they were denying them and we didn't have the workforce to go through and uh, rework those. So with our partners are able to surge surge at that. So they're able to um, cure, the, cure those denials um, and generate additional net revenue for the, for the facility. Yeah, I think it'd be really helpful for us to identify of the 8.2%, what do you think is really just getting paid appropriately for existing work that you're doing and what is the price effect? And then I understand there's a net negative utilization effect in there as well. So those moving parts would just be helpful to understand if you could. We and can follow up. Follow up is great, I think, yep. just to get the, the numbers there. Um, you're requesting a 6.8% increase in rate can you just tell us how that's distributed between inpatient, outpatient, and professional? Yep, I'll take that one again, Dan. Um, so it, it's 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 across the board. So it's a six point eight for for all areas. Okay. Great. Um, and so one of the areas you know that we are trying to understand is is relative pricing. Um, so I think you've we've you've heard us talk about the RAND 5.0, the RAND 5.0 data, which is just one data source, but it does suggest that Gifford's standard price for outpatient is significantly higher than other you know hospitals in the state. I think there's ten or so hospitals that are cheaper on an outpatient standardized price basis. Inpatient Gifford seems to be middle of the pack. Um, can you help us understand why the outpatient relative price is so high? And then how do we think about that when you're applying that 6.8% rate increase evenly across the three areas of inpatient, outpatient, professional? Bill, do you have that one? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can follow up. Um with a written response. Okay, that would be fantastic. Um, it seemed as though from the materials that were submitted uh, that part of the justification uh, for the budget overall and the rate request that does exceed the board's guidance um, is the need to support some of the losses that are incurred across the other corporations under Gifford Healthcare. So, and this may require follow-up, but I would like to understand what were the losses for the FQHC in 23 and 24 projected and what are projected losses in 25 and the same for the retirement community, just to understand how, how this rate might be used or this revenue, as it said, I think in here, this is the primary revenue source is the hospital for the collective entity. It's really important for us to understand 
what the losses are in the other aspects of the corporation? So the only the only direct subsidy is um, the, the federal government does um, uh, require that with the federally qualified health center that if it has a loss that it it, it can't have a loss. So any um, any loss that's incorporated there, uh, they want us to identify a source. So um, you know for us the source is the hospital. Um, I believe um, in the budget we are anticipating eight hundred thousand um, dollars and. Uh, for that, um, eight, it's not exactly 800, but it's 800 and change for that. Um, uh, and um, we do not have any direct subsidy of the uh, of, of the nursing home. Um, uh, the point that we were making in the uh, narrative was that in terms of our uh, debt covenants, we are jointly responsible for that. So uh, within that structure, um, we do have to have enough of a bottom line uh, for our uh, debt service coverage um, ratio covenant, and then uh, we also have to meet our days cash on hand uh, covenant uh, for that as well. Okay, so um, what has been the impact of the combined losses on the days cash on hand for the past couple of years of those other entities? Is that something that you are able to compute for us or calculate or in follow up is fine. Yeah, we can calculate that for you, but um, I, I, no, I, I'd love to follow up with it. Okay. Um, if the other two entities uh, broke even in fiscal year 25, would your, or projected to break even, would your commercial rate request be different? Considering your de debt covenants and your Days cash on hand impact and the need for capital investment and all that. I'm wondering if there's a way for you to back out for us. What would be the commercial rate request if those other two aspects of the corporation were breaking even? Yes. Follow up. Yes. I mean, okay. Yes. Yeah, so or, organization wide, our bottom line uh, in this budget is zero. So um, yes. So the difference is. Um, Bill or Steve, do you have right in front of you what the overall? So we can answer That's okay. That I, I don't like to do math yeah. on the fly. So if you don't yeah, like okay. to do math on the fly okay. and, and just to make sure that we're getting it accurate, it would be helpful for us to understand if the other two entities were literally breaking even, what would the commercial rate request be for this year for the medical, for the hospital? Okay. Um, specifically, it looks like you're budgeting uh, for a near doubling of the fringe benefits for MDs, um, whereas non-MD fringe is only up about 5%. The fringe benefits for MDs is up 93%. And I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to that. It seemed like a little bit of an outlier there. Salaries, Steve, is that something you yeah. can speak to? Yes, it can. I, it is something I could speak to. So what we actually had happened during our budget process is a changing of how we were mapping salaries for our APPs into the same bucket as MDs. It's due to an accounting change in our own uh, EMR system. It is very difficult to separate out those benefits and wages. So that is actually where the shift is you're seeing. And we did not increase benefits more okay. for MDs than we did for any other grouping. Okay. Fantastic. That's helpful to understand. Um, and it looked like there was a 20% increase in consulting purchased services. Any thoughts on what that is? Yeah, we out, well, we outsource billing and coding. Okay. So that went from uh, salaries and wages to um, contracts. Okay. Okay. Um, Inpatient, can we talk a little bit about inpatient care revenue? Um, just as I look at it over time, you know, in 2021, it was about $24 million. In 2022, $17 million. 23, $14 million. This year, you had budgeted $17 million, and it looks like it's coming in at about $9 million. So really precipitous decline there. I'm wondering, and next year, it looks like you have it budgeted at this year's approximate uh, projected amount. I'm wondering if you can speak to what's happening on the inpatient side in terms of this pretty significant drop in revenue. Jill, do you want to speak to that? 
you're muted. And sorry. Um, so we didn't have a really strong formal utilization review uh, program in prior years, to be honest. Um, we have implemented the interqual system and really shored up our care management. So our length of stay has dropped and our patients um, overall stay in the hospital has been less. So thus, we're not getting charged for those, you know, we're not uh, getting reimbursed for those additional days, but it's what's best for the patient. So significantly shortened our length of stay and the process of which we move them through the system. Got it. Okay. Um, and so what is your uh, average daily census there now? Typically, say, for 2024. Right. So we have ranged anywhere from a high of 17 to 18 down to four or five and huge fluctuation. I mean, yesterday afternoon we were at seven and this morning we were at 11 in our 12. So it just big variation, but they don't they don't stay long. So you are, are doing a lot of work and turning a lot of patients over it only to have the day end at 10 or 12. So um, we, we staff for a max of about uh, 15, but we see around that 10 is our average. Okay, so you staff for 15 and 10 is about the average. Well, we can flex to 15, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, your uh, 340B revenue is budgeted for zero for 25. What is the projected revenue for this year, if there was any? We're not projecting any for this year. The vast majority of our 340B goes through our, our FQHC. Okay. Has that been um, the same as in the past? Is that a switch? It's always gone through um, the FQHC? It's always um, predominantly gone through the FQHC since we've had the FQHC. Um, uh, it's been marginal at the hospital, but uh, uh, we have been impacted by the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, additional restrictions, particularly on the hospital side. So now it's marginal to nothing. Okay. Um, and then uh, two, sorry, two other questions. Hopefully they're fast. On the non-op revenue, it looked like in 23, uh, it was about $3 million. In 24 budget, it was budgeted at zero, but it looks like it's projected at 2.7 million. Um, and then it looks like you're budgeting, if I'm right, 300K for this year. Is this all, and you talked about donations, this is all donations, is this investment revenue in there as well? Uh, I'm sorry, were you talking about other revenue or other operating revenue or non-operating? Not. Non-op. Okay, non sorry, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so the 300,000 that we're budgeting in non-operating this year is solely for contributions and, and fundraising. Um, okay. The $2.7 million that's in there um, during, for actual 2024, is uh, uh, investment gains and losses, Okay. which, which and, flow does they have? And then 23, the 3 million was largely investment gains and losses, uh, some contributions? Yes. Okay. So for the last two years, you've been, you know, for 23, you'll get 3 million in uh, 24, 2.7 million. So is it possible that the 25, obviously we don't know what's happening with the stock market, but is it possible that that's a conservative estimate of non-operating revenue for 25? The well, it's, as you noted, it's completely dependent on the stock market. So, um, you know, okay. I, we typically don't budget for um, for gains just because I uh, can't remember the word uh, Bill used for it, but the fickle nature of that. So, um, right. If we depend on it and it's not there, then it, yeah. Understood. Understood. Okay. Um, and then my last actually is just more of a, a request on the clinical productivity front. Um, those percentiles are designed to cap at 100%. That the you know that's how most the most productive practices in the country are at the hundredth percentile. Um, so the data that you submitted obviously exceeds the hundredth percentile in a lot of different areas. So my my guess my request would be in the follow up to understand how you calculated those percentiles and actually if you could just submit the benchmarking data that you used. Um, so Steve, you know, the underlying. Steve raw Sorry. source of data there would be helpful. So Steve resubmitted that last week? 
Okay. Um, and uh, the problem with the original data was we were using um, MGMA uh, old benchmark uh, data for MGMA and using their more updated actual. So we had to go back and change it. So you now have um, you now have the updated, which is comparing apples to apples, and nobody's over hundred percent. Nobody's over hundred percent. Okay, sorry. I, with all the things that are coming in, it's nope, hard understood. to keep track of all of the <laughs> data that's understood. Coming in. I just. Yeah. Okay, that uh, that's helpful. I back to you, Chair. I think those are all my questions. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Member Holmes. Um, any other board members? I have a few remaining questions, although I must admit that Jess asked 85% of them or something. So I, it's going to take me a minute to sort through my questions because so many of them were asked. I, um, from, from now on, I want to go after Member Holmes. Yeah. I did have a little bit more. I just want to understand this decline in inpatient revenue a little bit more. Um, the Copley's hearing the other day, we discussed a decline in inpatient revenue that occurred a couple of years prior to yours. And it was it seemed like that may be associated with moving orthopedic care into an outpatient setting. Is that related to some of your inpatient revenue decline? It is. As I noted, we have a, um, uh, actually, uh, Dr. White raised his hand, so I guess I'll let him answer yeah, that's the trend that you're seeing nationwide, um, and largely it's a, um, a standard of improvement in care. Um, from the orthopedic perspective, 10 years ago, uh, if you had a hip, hip replacement, you spent a week patient on a PCA <clears throat> getting dilaudid. Um, now you go home same day with Tylenol. Um, it's a market improvement for the service to the patient, uh, but a significant loss as far as inpatient revenue. That same thing applies to a number of general surgery applications, gynecological applications, as there are laparoscopic advances, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was curious if that could be related to that. You know, I looked at maybe about a little over 40% decline. Um, does that impact your critical access hospital cost base reimbursements adversely to not have the associated inpatient costs, does that create challenges for you? Steve, do you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, so um, what you're referring to, um, the outpatient visits would still be counted towards that cost-based reimbursement. The only piece that gets, ex uh, gets uh, that's the word, excluded from that reimbursement is the professional piece. So, and that would be the case on inpatient as well. It does change it a little bit, but based on the models we've run, we haven't seen a huge change in what we're expecting. Okay. Um, you mentioned that inflation is, you're experiencing is 2.8%, but your commercial rate request is 6.8%. Can you help me square those two? Yeah, so um, the, we received, we gathered our inflation rates um, with help from our um, group purchasing organization and applied those to our expenses. Um, so there, that's why we're able to maintain um, a weighted average of 2.8%. Uh, um, but to, in order, again, in order to meet our um, debt obligations, um, we had to raise up to 6.8% to end up at the at the right amount. And those debt obligations are across Gifford Health is what I think we were talking earlier. All three entities, yes. Okay. Um, what is included in the Gifford Shared Services? Steve, do you want to discuss that? Yeah. I can take that. So Gifford Shared Services are all of our overhead departments. Uh, so it would actually be administration, accounting, uh, patient financial services, medical records, so on and so forth. All the pieces that support the operations of, of all the corporations. And, and we actually allocate those to the medical center and the health, health center and um, retirement community through um, cost, cost report approved allocation methods. So I wanted to touch on the RAND stuff as well. Um, I think Jess spoke about it and really framed some of my thoughts 
as well. But um, Gifford um, is one of the hospitals in Vermont that on the RAND data looks like it has very high standardized prices, uh, for especially for outpatient services. And looking at the workbook, uh, roughly maybe 10 to 1 outpatient to inpatient revenue ratio, it looks like maybe 90, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the revenue at Gifford comes from outpatient uh, compared to inpatient. So that outpatient price really impacts your your revenue, but it also really impacts the clearly the price that people in your community are paying for healthcare services and the you know and our overall healthcare spending. So I was trying to figure out. I was just hoping you guys could give me some thoughts about how you try to balance high prices for your community with hospital sustainability. So first off, I'd just say we need to analyze that RAND data a little more closely, uh, in particular, what year was that looking at? Because we did some reallocation based when we did our EMR. Um, and uh, I believe we did address some of these um, uh, concerns that you're uh, bringing forward and uh, board member Holmes brought forward um, uh, earlier. Um, but we need to look at that so that we can answer it um, so we can answer it correctly uh, back to you. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of affordability, I mean, that's in, in part why we chose to talk about some of the things that we did here uh, earlier. We are, um, uh, you know, we we have long been um, a proponent of population uh, health, of trying to help people where possible avoid more costly uh, care and uh, try to keep them healthy where we're able to do that. And um, so the items that we talked about earlier um, were designed uh, to illustrate that. Um, but in terms of the RAND study, again, uh, I do believe that that's probably data that predates our um, the changes in our um, uh, electronic health record system and uh, our charge master. So we would need to compare that back to um, uh, you know, to where we are now. Any, any any insight to understanding this better would be helpful for us. The, I believe the RAND 5.0 data is from 20 to 22 and have up here, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you had reasonable charge increases during that time, but I also remember from last year's <laughs> budget hearing that you discussed that you had not been able to update the charge master for a couple of years. And it sounded like there was going to be, at least the way I came away from that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the that once that charge master was going to be updated, there would be an increase in prices that were that you weren't able to reflect your prior few uh, budget rate increases. So I guess my I was gonna ask a question, but maybe, you know, are, are, should we expect a big increase in prices due to that updated charge master, or is there something, some other way you're approaching that? So when we when we reworked the charge master in 2024, there were some areas that increased and some that decreased with the net impact, um, you know, netting out. Um, what we did last year uh, in terms of what the board um, approved was reimbursement increase. Um, there was a there was a small a rate increase, but large part of what you approved last year was reimbursement uh, increase. So in increasing what we're paid by the insurance companies as opposed to increasing our rates um, that entire amount. So um, that was what we were unable to take advantage of. Our, we were unable to enact uh, in the, the prior couple of years because we had identified that we needed to uh, improve our revenue cycle in our in our charge master. So it wasn't what what you improved wasn't simply a rate increase over the, that time. We were um, we negotiated our uh, reimbursement from the insurance companies. Okay, that's my understanding. Is that uh, when the board approves an increase, it it's improves it um, it leads to an increase in those negotiated rates that are averaged over the services provided by a single insurer. Um, I guess I'm trying. I'm still trying to help me understand the charge master impact of all this. Then. 
So again, to get to specifics, we would have to, I can't answer all the specifics for you uh, without okay. going back and doing some research, but it's we would, we had some areas that we brought charges down when we, re, when we um, put our electronic health record in our new, we had to create a new charge master for the new electronic health record. And we were, um, there were some areas where we reduced charges uh, because of the very reasons you're talking about. Um, and there are other areas where we were lower that we um, leveled that out. Okay. But a all in all, you should expect yeah, a narrative that explanation was... would be helpful, I think, for us to understand it because it, it, I must admit, it was challenging for me to quite understand how that was working last year, too. Okay. Thank you. Um, and... So one thing that was a standout in the workbook, which I don't, I know there's some challenges with the, some of the data in there, but it appears that when we look at patient boarding in the boarding section of the workbook, um, that Gifford actually generates revenue off of patient boarding. The, the way I read it is that for the associated uh, expenditures, they all had associated reimbursements that were higher than the expenditures, which I must admit, I don't know I, if, um, I, I need to sort of go look at other hospitals on this now. I mean, I definitely looked at many of the hospitals and none of them showed that basically they were generating income off of patient boarding, but it appears, and I don't know if that's a function of a critical access hospital based on the cost-based reimbursement, but I was just wondering if this, if you could sort of help me understand this a little better, why there could be uh, how it is that you can have higher reimbursements than your expenditures on a patients that are boarding. This is inpatient boarding, awaiting um, discharge home or to a post acute care. Steve, do you have the answer to that? Yeah. So, um, and, and so a lot of the revenue and receipts is, is estimated because we don't have a direct correlation between the, those visits and reimbursement. And we get a settlement on the cost report for costs associated with with visits. And it was just an allocation of those. Uh, again, it was an estimate and it could be if we were to somehow be able to we were somehow able to do a micro view of it, it might not be uh, you know, a, a profit, it might be, might be a loss, might be break even. But not having that actual data to, to drill into is difficult to come up with a number. Okay. Um, give me one second. And then uh, the last question I had for you is I was looking at your balance sheet and looking at cash and assets going from FY20 to FY20. Um, FY24 budget. Um, FY23 actuals have a pretty low total current asset number in here of $9.7 million. Um, with cash and investments going from 17.9 million in 2020 to 1.3 2020 actuals. I was just wondering if you could help me understand this downward trend in your cash position. Um, yeah. Steve, do you have that or you? Yeah, I, I think so. So uh, during the pandemic, we actually received a an advance from the payers to uh, to help float cash while we were working through the pandemic. Um, that did go down through the years, which is why you saw a decrease. Also budget 24, we were budgeting a higher utilization, um, which we didn't realize. We're also in an EMR implementation year, which also caused cash reserves to dive as any other hospital going through an EMR implementation will experience. Um, does that answer your question? I think, it's, I think that does. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
All right, that is what I have for questions. Thank you so much. Any other board members? I can jump in with, I have just a couple. Uh, most of my questions also have been answered. Um, this is really, I think, related to one of the follow-ups that, uh, that Jess asked for, but I was noticing that uh, when we look at 24 projected to 25 budget, the NPR increase is actually 13.2%. So when you're when you're doing that breakdown related to the um, better collection issue, it might be helpful to, if some of that 13.2 is also driven by that, it, that would be helpful to know, because I think it that's a big shift from where you're actually expecting to end this year to next year's budget. Um, so I wanted to just ask about that and put that in the hopper. And then the other question I had is why is it given sort of the issues with the bond covenants, et cetera, why is this the year to catch up on capital expenses? Because we've been, um, deferring them for some time. And as you know, you can only defer them for a period of time. Um, I wouldn't categorize 3.4 million uh, as a big catch up year um, or as Bill noted, it's less than our annual depreciation. So in fact, um, it is going to be uh, our age of plant will go up uh, based on this plan. So um, I think our point in that was that we can't continue to defer to the extent that we have the last couple of years. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I would not categorize it as a big catch up year. Thanks. Uh, and then my last question is, um, you noted that on um, this, the resubmission on Friday that you updated the productivity numbers. Could you also let me know what else you changed? Because quite frankly, getting that so late did not give me time to understand what changed between uh, in the new submission. So you so want was, in addition was to- there, Was there anything else that was updated other than productivity? Yes, um, I, I can answer that if you if you want, Dan. Yeah. Man. Uh, so the um, the previous submission included APPs as well as positions. It was a misreading of the requirements, so that also removed the APPs and just has the positions as well as the 2024 MGMA numbers. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Member Walsh, do you have any questions? No, Chair Foster, I'm all set. Great. Um, I, I just had one. On, in the narrative, you noted that Gifford budgeted 3.9 million of fixed prospective payments for fiscal year 24, but there was a reduction from the expiration of Medicaid's COVID-19 expansion, um, leaving a shortfall of 1.3 million. Did any of that uh, reduction in, in Medicaid FPP uh, show up elsewhere, as in commercial or people transi transitioning to another payer? Bill or Steve, uh, I mean, I can wage an answer, but. I, I can try to tackle this. Um, so. Some pay, uh, some patients more than likely did go to self-pay, some did go to commercial, but we don't have any uh, direct correlation that we can provide. It, it would take some considerable drill in. Is that something you would like? Well, so it, it's just not clear to me that it will actually be a shortfall if they end up as self-pay or in commercial. So it's unlikely that... Um, um, it's unlikely that significant numbers of them ended up in commercial. Uh, these are people who were uh, no longer determined uh, to be on the Medicaid uh, role. So, um, you know, this is something that every every hospital that participated in the uh, all payer model um, was. Um, uh, they all we we all um, had the same impact. 
uh, from this. Um, uh, I can talk a little bit about, and we do have um, like uh, Grace Cottage was talking about previously today, we do have a program called Health Connections uh, where we have uh, now two counselors who meet with people to try to identify what benefits there are available are available to them and or help them um, sign up um, on the marketplace uh, for for benefits. So we do work um, diligently uh, toward that. But uh, you know, again, to Steve's point, um, we would have to track each individual member to know that I mean, it is possible that. I'm sure some of them did either through the marketplace or uh, other ways um, obtain other benefits. But um, our point in including that in the narrative was that that was why that individual line item was so far off from what we had budgeted. And what's your best supposition about where these the bulk of these patients ended up? So if they're not on Medicaid, some small number ended up potentially in the QHP plans. Are the others just self-pay or not going to get care or are in free care or bad debt? I, I would be guessing, um, yeah. but I mean, yeah, I, I would be guessing. Fair, fair enough. Um, I don't have any other questions. Uh, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, I'm wondering, one thing that we look at obviously is free care to bad debt or bad debt to free care. Um, I'll use the second one, bad debt to free care. Um, one thing we observe is changes between what folks budget and what the actuals are. There's a lot of variance across the hospital system. And one thing I thought was particularly notable about your submission is that you're really projecting to go from four to one bad debt to free care to almost one to one in just one year. And I guess I'm kind of piggybacking on Chair Foster's question how confident, I guess, are you that you can do that transition, which is a pretty big one in just one year? Bill, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. So, um, uh, Act 119 went into effect uh, on July 1st. Um, and so I went to our, our counselors and asked them, uh, you know, how well, how many new applications have we had since the, the one month? Um, so, Prior for the first six months, we had 150 applications. And in the first month of it, with Act 19, we had 70, 70 new ones. So I, I am very confident that uh, we're going to be able to move um, all of that into um, to, to that free care or discount, free or discounted care. Um, also, at our registration um, desks when somebody comes in we have a a grid and ask them to please provide an estimate of where their household income and their family size is and so we, we're capturing that in our um in our emr system as well um and i think that just brings it to the forefront of everybody's thought that oh there is free care available um so anecdotally um i do see that uh gifford will be moving um, towards that. Um, and it really is, you know, a, a great thing for the community as well. Mm -hmm. No, thank I you. And thank you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that, I, I mean, um, uh, you're going to, I'm going to say the same thing. One of the um, individuals in Grace Cottage said is that we still have a large number of people who um, will not provide the information so that we can move them uh, into the that free care uh, category. So we will continue uh, to work with that. As I noted, we do have now two counselors um, who uh, who do work with people, and uh, that is something that um, we do uh, diligently um, work on. As we do, we would prefer that they, uh, if they're eligible, that they they do get that benefit. No, thank you. Apologies for interrupting. And thanks for working with our office. Uh, I know that we've been in touch um, working, helping you to come into compliance. Um, I have two questions based on my review of your audited financials. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on your contractual relationship with Mazars USA. It looks like around $1.5 million you paid them in 2024. And looks like you have an ongoing commitment with them for a couple of years. Just wondering if that's still active and what services you get for them. That's the group through which we did the outsourcing uh, for billing and coding. Um, so that is um, 
uh, you know, we do have a, an ongoing contract with them uh, for that. Okay. Um, and the other one is you talked about, you know, just in the narrative, actually, in, in talking about your performance in audit of financials, you talked about the retirement community. And one of the plans that you had was reducing expenditures in the areas of supplies and purchase services. I'm wondering, like, how big of a problem you think that is in terms of kind of mitigating some of the ongoing losses there. Um, that that alone isn't going to get us there. That is an initiative we have. The um, uh, you know what we've identified in particular is that there is some improvement we could make in the cost of raw food. Um, that is a big part of it. Um, although, as you know, we all know, uh, food costs have gone up significantly. Um, so trying to find ways to be uh, more efficient in um, what we're doing there. Um, uh, we're also uh, looking at expense lines across the board. Um, I will, um, uh, we, we are working with the Agency of Human Services as well. We did uh, make an application in their extraordinary financial relief program for the nursing home specifically. That's, it's for nursing homes. Um, and we are in the final stages of that. Um, and uh, we're just waiting for the uh, final paperwork from them to sign uh, that EFR agreement. So we will get some temporary uh, relief uh, from that um, specific to the nursing home. Okay, thank you. Um, the last question, I was just curious if you could speak a little bit more about the international recruitment. That sounded really encouraging. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what were some of the biggest challenges and barriers to getting that started? That's Jill. Yeah. So um, our whole immigration system. So if you guys could fix that, that'd be awesome. Uh, so I have found it's most successful with um, nurses that have come here and are American educated and already have their student visa. And then it's really a process of converting that student visa to a work visa. And you have to have that sponsoring organization. Um, uh, InSpring is a company that we've been using to work with them, and they um, you pay them a fee, but they have um, you know immigration lawyers who really can hone in on what needs to happen and can really kind of simplify a very very complicated process. Um, it's a couple barriers that we have is that in order for this workforce to come in, it has to be in positions that are designated for higher level degrees. So they have to be positions that require BSN or MSN um, jobs. So like in our lab area, we can't bring them in if you could have an associate doing the job, an associate's degree doing the job. Or in areas like in our med surge floor where we don't require everyone is BSN prepared, we might prefer it. We can't bring those folks in. So there's some barriers that are built within the system. Um, the nurses that are practicing nurses in other countries that are trying to come here without having that student visa, it's a little more challenging for them. Um, they have to, um, it's about $5,500 for their spouse and any of their children to come over. We certainly pay for them to come over, but a family of four is going to have like 20 grand just to try to come into the country. And then their spouse will not have the ability to work here because they won't have a social security number. So only one of the working household would be able to work. So it's a lot of this is really within our immigration system. Um, but I can honestly tell you that the nurse that we brought in is fabulous. She's thankful. She's a hard worker. She's great. She's, um, you know, we're just so lucky to have her. And we have got a couple others in the queue. And I was planning for them to start at Dartmouth on the 19th of August with their Perry Up 101. And they haven't made it through processing yet. So um, some big opportunity there for sure. Because we, you know, even if everyone's doing everything right and we're trying to shore up our schools of nursing, um, we don't have enough folks to fill how many people are leaving the profession. So we do need to look at external sources. You've got great qualified people that are more than willing to come here and, and want to work here. And um, so I've been happy to work with that company and uh, I would like to use them for more things, but have a lot of limitations on that. Did that answer your question? Yes, no, thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, there's a lot of activity in the J1 waiver space legislatively too. So but yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. And those are all my okay. questions. Sure.
Chair Foster, are, is your audio struggling right now? I think it might be. Um, so with that, I think what I will do is I will thank you all. Gifford, we really appreciate all your time. I don't think there's any other, unless there's public comment, I think public comment will be at the end. So I think what we will do is um, pause um, and come back at three o'clock when we will hear from North Country. But thank you again to the Gifford team for your presentation. Really appreciate it.